Hello all, I am Patrick Farrar and thank you for joining us for another installment of the Opinionated Stance podcast. Please do me a huge favor and visit opinionatedstance.com. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play. Also, head over to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have any comments, questions, and show ideas, please reach out. We always love to hear the feedback from our listeners. And thank you again for listening to all the shows. Today's topic uh, that we'll be discussing and talking about today looks to take a deep dive into a common product development process. Oftentimes, I'm asked by people, what are some steps that I can do to get a product or to get started building my startup, or how do I start building out XYZ product? Our goal today will be to explore the steps and processes involved with building a minimum viable product from a software and product perspective. My guest today is Adam Yala. Adam Yala is a software engineer who has worked with various startups and companies in different stages in the Chicago community. Um, Each time that I see Adam, he is always telling me about a new product or idea that he's starting or working on. So I felt it was a natural fit to have him on the show, uh, on the podcast, when we talked about building out MVPs. Welcome to the podcast, Adam. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing really good. I'm excited to be here. That's awesome. Uh, Wonderful. Why don't you give people a little bit of a brief description of your background that I didn't say? Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually went to school to be an accountant, and I am a tax accountant turned web developer. Uh, one of my first web apps ever was to try automating something I saw every day in tax accounting. And ever since then, I just fell in love with programming and web development and building products. That's awesome. So thank you again for being here. So let's hop in. So as I briefly described before, MVP means minimum viable product. And in software, you, this is usually a beta product. So where do you see the product or the process begin when you are building out a new idea? Does it start with um, market sizing and market analysis. Does it size, look, start with like market need? Does it look at problem identification or do you like look to reverse engineer um, an existing solution or does it have a combination of like potentially all of those different topics? I think it is a lot of those things. In terms of the things I've built, it's been a combination of things I thought were really cool and I tried to build something really quick, problems I've seen and now it's more of sort of scratching my own itch. Yeah. So like when you start to scratch your own itch, how do you take in like, so you have this idea for something, you know, that there's a, obviously there's probably a need in your personal life. Like, how do you know that it's something that you want to invest time in? Is it, do you take and figure out, are other people going to be willing to do this or use this? Or is it more like, okay, I'm going to build this. And if it gets traction, it gets traction. If not, I don't have any need to build this or what? To me, a lot of it, first, I'm a big believer that I am not a unique snowflake. And if I am willing to pay for something, someone else is willing to pay for something. So a lot of it, I mean, the uh, the project I'm working on now, it took me two years to realize like, oh, someone might pay for this. At first, it was just a project for my own and for myself to use. And yeah, I definitely think that's a big part of it. Just not thinking that you're unique. If you have a need, someone else has that need. Right. So you do a little bit of uh, market need analysis, but market analysis in general, like to, for the product you're working on right now, like if you want to go into detail, yeah, yeah. you can, but uh, if not, I understand. Um, what are some of the steps that you found that if other people had need as well? Yeah. Um, a lot of it was talking to, so I'm a web developer and I'm building a, an API for developers. So some of it is just talking to other developers and saying, I'm building this, would you use it? Right. Even if they wouldn't pay for it yet, to me, getting someone to use something is a big step. Right. So you took and figured out that there's a need that people would potentially want to do that. Did you look and talk to people? Like, Did you like just go out to people and say, hey, are you willing to do this through your peer group? Or did you do surveys or market research? Or how, does, like, how did you take and get yeah. people's responses? The, uh, so one of the first things I ever made was uh, a system to automate uh, property tax assessments. Because okay. you make these reports and you give them to the county assessor and you work with them to figure something out. And I built something really quick and dirty and then started showing it to people. And I mean, this thing isn't even, wasn't even MVP. It was all static, had some buttons people could click on. Right. And I showed it to people and unfortunately they said, no, I wouldn't pay for this. Right. But it was super nice because then I could stop working on it. Yeah, I mean, I had an idea with that with a a project that's still in the hopper because there's opportunity um, when things uh, in this country potentially open up again f- around um, online sports betting yeah, uh, and FanDuel and the daily stuff. But it was like, for me, what I did was I built out this product. I had the prototype. I had a stack. I had everything built in a way that 
if I could take and get people to see the value in it, it was good. I took it out to Vegas. I took it out and talked to some people there um, in the entrepreneurial community because that was my market. Like if I could take and look at, you know, here's people that are betting in sports books. If they can say, oh, would you be willing, if I could ask them and say, would you be willing to use this? Yes or no. They don't have to pay for it. Okay. They'd have feedback of what their current flow is yeah, and how this software could augment that and be better. So I think for me, it's like getting out there, like the key to any of these projects and processes is getting out there and talking um, to the client and understanding that not, it's not always going to be yes. Like if you went out to somebody today, it's like if I could put something on your phone where you can update your status in real time with your friends and maybe take photos and share that stuff would you be willing to pay for that it's like no facebook's there so identifying that market need or the other players in there is more important than what your product could be Mm -hmm. right and identifying that that's interesting have you seen any situations where people do that they find that it's not good reception and then they build it anyway and keep pushing it because a lot of the i mean the term pivot is to me exactly that it's someone built something they put it out there no one's using it and they still want to chase after it. Yeah, I think pivot is different a little bit. I think pivot means that somebody is going to change their whole business idea. Okay. Um, not necessarily the business idea, but it's like I'm going to be building out a director, an online directory that categorizes gummy bears. Okay, well, there's no market need for that. So I have this online directory. What if I could turn that into events? And so that's a pivot. You change your actual scope, you change the market, and you do a different Hmm. analysis. Um, There are times that people get in that trap where they continue to do the online gummy bear directory. And I think that's one of the problems that you have in the startup communities. People don't understand. They think that failure is a bad thing. And like they often, often say fail fast, and I don't necessarily agree with fail fast. It's like I think of Kenny Rogers and... Uh, the song, you know when to hold them, know when to fold them, mm-hmm. right? The poker reference. Uh, you need to know that it's not always now that your idea is going to hit. You might have the best idea, but you, it, you might not, the, your marketplace might not be ready for that. So it could be wait. So in the case with the sport track, which I was building, this analytics platform, it, I could have launched it in Las Vegas and took and did things there. And there was a, demographic of people who could pay for it but the subscription model would have been different it was really going to take traction when the national like we had legislation that allowed online sports betting and sports betting nationwide to have this information source go through um so for me i had to know that they were going to say this is not the time to take and do this and focus efforts on other things because the time is even though it's free or perceived to be free like when you're working as a developer opportunity cost it's opportunity cost you can work on something else and i think uh yes there may be early stage startups where you could take and have 20 hours to do something right if you're working on something that's not have a market for right now why don't you find something to work on that can have a market for right now and I think a lot of times, sometimes people just build projects out to try new technologies and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Trying out new technologies and using that as a sandbox if you're working for an employer or if you're trying to get something off the ground and understand it. But you got to know that sometimes there's better investments of time. Return on investment, like your key thing is your time. Like yeah, we were t- I was talking to a friend a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about the, the notion of contracting and what time is regarded to that and he said something that was interesting it's like oh when you discount or when you say oh i'm going to give you this i'm going to do this for free it's not that you're doing something to, for somebody for free in the web world you're giving them a hundred percent discount and you need to articulate the value of what you're doing like yes. i think in a even in a product standpoint and when you're developing out software like on your own like you got to think about that it's like yeah you're not going to put it at the end of the day there might not be a business around this yet, but you need to associate like what your investment is in. Yeah. And uh, on the topic of creating an idea and getting that first initial start, I also think doing something you enjoy and you're passionate about is very important. Like you said, uh, you did the sports betting and it's something that you're passionate about. You care about it. And at the end of the day, like you said, your time is discounted a hundred percent when you're working on things, whether it's for yourself or someone else. Right. And when you reach that, 200th hour of free work like 
loving what you do is also a huge part of it. Yeah. I mean, that's what helps you push through to take and make it be the 201st hour to the 400th hour. Um, but you also have to know that just because you love doing something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do for you that time. It's a balance. You need to take and stop. Like if I love to um, play golf all the time, but it's getting in the way of something else, I need to stop. And that's anything for any product or software that you're trying to build um, from an MVP. I think that people oftentimes, early, early entrepreneurs that see the valuations and see all the unicorn valuations and hear about Silicon Valley and don't under really understand the software side of things or how to build the technology out, um, get blinded by these figures of, it's not just millions, it's billions of dollars, but they don't understand the billions of dollars that go into it. Yep. Um, and so they think that their idea is the best thing. And you know it might be the best thing, but they don't do enough market analysis to see what are the competitors? Who's the indirect competition? What am I trying to do? Are we competing with the same user base? Like there's a lot of different factors in there that people need to just understand prior to taking in, you know, even if they're trying to put their own capital up. Like at the end of the day, after doing startups for numerous years, the, you, it, you want to use that thank you culture um, and have all ships rise together. What do you mean the thank you culture? Um, you want people to be win-win relationship for everything. So you want to take in work and ways to do that. Sometimes the worst way to take in do a win-win is when you fail to say no. Yeah. And you get into a situation where one person has an advantage over another. And I, I don't know what that means in terms of like, if you have business partners and one person's putting more in and more not, I mean, we were just talking about like that book with equitable distribution. Yes. Um, I think that kind of plays into this a little bit. Like if you can explain that a little bit, what we were talking about. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, a colleague gave me a book recently called slicing pie by Mike Moyer. And, uh, it's a way where everyone tracks their hours as time goes on in a startup. All those hours have a value attached to them. They're dumped into a bucket and then there will be a time later on when that pie is sliced and everyone is given mm -hmm. equity slices. And that's, so everything's dynamic and based on the performance of people and the success of people. And you save equity negotiations for the end because if you have no product, there's no point in getting in each other's hair right. about equity. Yeah, I mean, like some of the things that we've seen like in my years of helping and mentoring at Startup Weekend is people want to go into that weekend and have that equity talk like as the first thing because they think that's going to be the home run. And let me tell you, startup weekend is the great, is a great thing to work on and be involved with in terms of from a participation standpoint to a mentorship to just a networking you've done participation. And is, is one coming up in Chicago soon? One's coming up in March. Um, and it's a great opportunity to understand it, it's learning how to work in that startup thing. But most people that come in, it's like it's dipping your toe in that the baby pool to test the water. Mm -hmm. um, but you think about the back end way too for too much and sort of learning the process of how to do that. Um, I think one of the interesting things for me is you were talking about like MVP and the click model, like where you were talking and building out just like rough wireframes and screens. And that's interesting because I always view MVPs as it's, a minimum viable product of the message you're trying to get to the audience you're trying to tell it to. It's not always have to be software related. So a PowerPoint presentation could be an MVP to hire a developer or bring someone on or just communication. I think it's a tool more than it's a tool or, and a methodology more so than it's a hard and fast. Like this is exactly what we're going to build, build it like a prototype is different or wireframes like what are your thoughts on that oh yeah if i could go back in time when i first started learning software development i think i would have become a designer because with all the tools like sketch and uh, envision and all that stuff that's been released it is so easy for good designers to create beautiful proto like wireframe prototypes to show people yeah. they're not mvps they don't actually function right but uh but it's just it opens up the world for you. But like, yeah. So more or less what I'm saying is like, even though it's a wireframe, it's a prototype, that's an MVP because the goal it like, it's what the MVP, the minimum viable thing is used for. It's the, it's the sentiment behind it. It's a designer might be doing this for somebody who's paying them. And that person that's paying them might be using it to hire a developer or go get an investment round. It's not necessary or, it's not necessarily like, like this is the product. Mm -hmm. Like we've heard about vaporware and different things like, and people can 
hire a developer or, or designers build it out and go get investment and it's not a good strategy because nothing ever comes of it it's a bad relationship but i think like personally like i we could have an mvp right like doing a business card that's a minimum viable product for a business contact like building a personal website that's a minimum viable product for building your own brand and doing things out that way oh yeah i mean yeah. it totally scales with like you said the person that you're trying to uh, represent the message to a friend of mine was working on a, a travel tech startup and he used sketch and envision and made his little mobile prototype. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day for his product to really come to fruition, people have to be using it. Like that's just the nature of his product. Right. So while that little, you know, wireframe is great at the end of the day, he should be building a MVP to show a developer. Right. So that that developer can help him build the product for the customer. Right. And so like, again, it kind of goes to that point. It's like, where do you start in this process? And I think a lot of it is um, understanding what your objective is through an MVP. Like, okay, is it to gain a developer? Is it to secure users? Because I th I'd say that 95% of software MVPs are to secure users. You've already got something, you've already got a product, some people are gonna work with it. You're just using it to secure that first set of users or get a beta out to figure out, okay, is there something even here? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a key thing. I think that one of the big things that you said is market validation, like market understanding what market validation is and understanding that if your users are going to tell you if they want it or not, you can't be so blind that they're not going to listen to them. Like, and I think one of the only ways you can listen to users is like understanding the difference between a paying customer and a non paying customer. And those are very different things in terms of, you know, we always talk about, 80, 20 rule, 80% of your revenue should come from 20% of your customer base. Well, if they're not paying, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. I was talking to a friend about putting together this little social network app. And the one thing that took us a long time to really think about and realize is that if you pursue a social network, monetization is going to be the last thing you worry right. about. Like for their, long. for their, you, you're in this for the long game. Like you just want to build user base, build stickiness, and then monetization is an afterthought. Whereas if you build like a project management software, monetization is rule number one. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, in a project management software, you're trying to get the user to be into that ecosystem and not want to change. And then the revenue thing is a very interesting thing. So when you focus on, so in the discovery phase of, building out an MVP, what is more important? Getting the product to market or perfect execution? Product to market. Really? I think every single time. I think users are incredibly forgiving. And I mean, I've taken back softwares that were not great. And I think users will forgive and just put it out there and see what people want. Yeah. So like, what are, like, what are some of the technical benefits of just getting it to market versus taking and working to build it like to the you know, the designs that come out from designers are amazing and they're beautiful and they're usually uh, comprehensive because their scope of work ends at that particular thing. They build the identity, they build the site out. Um, as a developer, your scope of work begins when you get that and you want to get something out. They, and there might be criteria pushing you to get that out faster. Um, is there anything that you've seen in stuff that you've worked on with startups and minimum viable products that has changed once you've got your initial beta out the door? Hmm. I think so I mentioned the social network yeah. app. I built a really quick one in two weeks, put it out there, showed it to some people, people used it. And a big part of it was seeing people use it once or twice and then never touch it again. Okay. And it was just nice because it told me, it didn't tell me that that market was bad but the way i approached it was very bad okay so expand on that how did you approach it first off for sure so um i it was it's it was kind of like uh, untapped where you check into things okay and uh everyone came in when i shared it they checked in once or twice and then they just left and never came back okay and to me a big part of that is just stickiness like yeah. it said it means that the features i put in that none of them were sticky and that's okay I know what not to do. Were they, were they not sticky because there was other things in the market that were satisfying that particular need? They were not sticky because I feel that depending on the technology you're, you're building and mm -hmm. depending on what you're doing, you need a certain level of trust with users. So if I was building a financial app, 
then I need to generate a pretty high amount of trust for someone to give me credentials to get into their bank. Right. I mean, that's SSN. That's yeah. bank account information. Yeah. And, so it go- to- and it goes beyond SSL and encryption. It goes to like someone seeing a product, seeing a mission, seeing an identity and saying like, yes, I trust this. Yeah, it goes to that's why we talk about with branding is building brand loyalty and goodwill within the community. Yeah, I could build the most awesome, you know, credit card. Uh what's that credit card that is the plastic one that puts all the other different credit cards in it? Oh, like, coin. Yeah. I could build a coin, a coin too. Like yeah. we'll call it dime or something yeah. like that. I don't even know. If shekel. Something. Shekel. Yeah. Like pence, whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but unless I do that with a brand that says that I am as good as coin and not, a, and better than Visa, MasterCard, other things, people aren't going to take and switch to that. There's obviously switching cause for that. Yeah. Um, but what that, what that, to me, what I learned from that is to me, I thought the requirements for my MVP were a social network that people can interact with. But really, I learned that my requirements for an MVP are a brand and a concept and a vision sticky enough where people trust me. Okay. So with that notion of that learning and things, because that's where we talk about that fail fast, would you take and pivot that idea or would you take and pocket those learnings as I got some gain out of this and then go focus on something else and use that to take and um, work on something else, another different project with these learnings of like, okay, I have to assess a brand and do some analysis first prior to taking and releasing. What, as soon as I saw that what I built was not sticky and effective, I went and found the people I knew who could help me start to develop a stickiness. Okay. And so that's me reattempting the same concept. So you were in the same, you were in the same vertical, you were continuing yes. to work yes. on that. Yes. And but I can tell you right now that if I approached those people and they said like I'm not really interested in building this with you, I would have stopped. Okay. Cuz I can take it a certain distance, but if other people don't share my passion, then maybe if no one has any interest or passion in it, then maybe right. it's not a great idea. Yeah, or maybe it's not a great idea for now. For now, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, think IBM released the iPhone in like 1990, but broadband wasn't a thing, so right. that it didn't. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I um. So do you think that your idea, that your software, did you do any, do you think it was market, the market was saturated? I don't think the market is saturated. Uh, I talked to some people at work where we have a, uh, sim- I, we have a simple chat room that a lot of us mm-hmm. share. It's not work related. We it's just a chat room of people I right. am coworkers with. Right. It's and, a peer group. Yes. And everyone said that they would be interested in a product like this, but even though they said they would use it, they didn't. Yeah. Have you ever encountered a situation like that where you've sort of gotten and you've vetted that demand, but then it just hasn't been there? Yeah. I think um, I can talk about one kind of briefly. Yeah. That we did. It was an experiment that I worked with. Uh, a colleague of mine, Zach Gilbert, Jason, and Ben, we were doing some uh, thing last year where we were trying to take and fill a void that the Sunrise application, that Microsoft yes. purpose. Yes. Yeah, they uh, bought, they were going to sun, they were going to sunset Sunrise. Um, and so we were taking and building out this, we were exploring the idea of taking and building a, com, uh, not a competitor, but a complementary product to fill the void, the market void. Um, and one of the most interesting things that we talked about in it was how are we going to take and validate that there's a need for this and that there's a paying need for this Um, because the long for it was if this is a calendar app and Microsoft just bought one, they're probably not going to need to buy one and Google's got their own thing. So there's no exit for it. But before we took and did any work on the actual application, we decided to, we did minimal stuff, but we did a basically an MVP. We put a landing page up that talked about what our goals were. Um, and it was like, you can do some of this with Kickstarter, but we basically said, hey, would you be willing to pay $10 for this? We had a target in mind that if we hit that, we would start to take in, do the initial build out. And I think the initial build out would have been like 500 users and we had about 50 sign up for it. And that right there was, okay, we heard from people that yes, there's a need in the marketplace. The, the market has spoken. They love this Sunrise app. They love all the features of it. It's gone to Microsoft. They say on Twitter there's this huge, like, huge amount of like sentiment going on. Like, we want this. Don't don't shut it down. Don't shut it down. But then when we actually ask people to bet with their dollars, like, would you pay for this? Because no one does it for free. Everybody like there's costs involved with doing that. The number drastically 
changes. And I think that's a big thing. It's like when you're doing any type of market validation, you have to understand that having somebody say, yes, I'm going to use it and having a paying customer is a two different thing. Like, yeah, you can say I'm going to have 42 betas that are going to be on free trials. Like I'm just like hypothetically throwing out some numbers that could be free trials, but how are you going to convert them to de demonstrate value to become a full paying customer? So I think you don't, like as you're taking and figuring out like the process of releasing some software or product or whatever, you understand that that first trial period is like, it's what you do to get people in the door. It's like what, why Uber gave, gives away free things, but your whole goal is to figure out what the customer lifetime value of that person is and then try to deliver a value for that. I mean, even in cloud software as a service right now, if you take a $15 model, like $15 monthly model for a user, what is that? Um, it's uh, $164 a year. Okay. No, that's not right. So 10 it's a no, Yeah, it's yeah. a number. It's, yeah, it's a number. Uh, and that's a lot. That's an investment that you're thinking. Like, think about that. What can I use those hundreds of dollars for? Can I get better value out of the software that you're doing? Or uh, taking and use it on something else. And the interesting part about that is if it's, yeah, oh, I'll try that for sure. Everybody goes to Costco and loves the free samples, but no one ever buys it. Yeah. Uh, did you ever use Parse? Parse. It's um, like Firebase. Yeah, it's a back end as a service. I think Facebook put it out, correct? Yes. Yeah. It was incredible. I it knew in, tons of people who used it. Yeah, about three, four years they had its heyday. Yes. Yes. It, tons of people used it. They all loved it. When Facebook shut it down, they were heartbroken. But all these people were on free plans. Right. So they loved it. Now it's open source. You can go to AWS and stand up your own instance of it. But people truly loved it, but not enough to pay for it. Right. And that's an interesting thing. It's like, I think the, I can equate this to my personal thing. I'm going to take it outside of software, but I'm going to take it to music. Um, I paid, I first had, God, what was the system? It was called Moog. A couple years ago, like 2009, it was one of the first early on um, uh, streaming services. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was like when Napster and Rhapsody were huge. Moog was the first one that had a lot of, um, like a lot of full length albums. This was prior to Spotify's US thing. But for me, I was buying on iTunes, I'd buy an album. And I remember like I'd buy Eminem's Relapse. Uh, and I'd spend $9 on that to get that. And then what I would do is like, I'd listen to it. It's like, okay, I'd have to put it on my device. And it was all this management stuff. And then I went to Moog and it wasn't the, like, and this was around the narrative that everybody was talking about, like nobody's paying for music. And I don't think that was necessarily the case. It just, that was for me, the shift in how my music consumption was. Um, I'm going to get to how it like goes back. Yeah. To yeah. The, Take your time. Um, thing. And I think a lot of it is in that notion, like people will pay for Spotify um, and different things, kind of like those people who are using Parse for free, they pay a subscription and get the unlimited benefit for it. So when everything, something change, changes inside of the service, they get really upset by it. Um, what it did for me, all these inventions of these uh, s streaming services changed my habits as a consumer, which allowed me to take and go for um, supporting artists in a way that I choose to by going in. Either if it's at a show, I'll go buy their vinyl or I'll see them more live. And I'll purchase, yes, I will, like, I will get my main means of consumption through the commodity, which would be Spotify, which is similar to the people doing par stuff. And yeah. it's like there. But then at the end of the day, I get to support my individual causes by taking and going out to shows and supporting the end user using Bandcap to buy the, I've rebought albums multiple times for the support thing. So I think um, the main thing that I'm trying to get to is, don't bitch if you can't put the money out to support. There's a reason their things are being made. And if you want to have a voice in something, you vote with your dollars. Oh, yeah. So if you're trying to take and change something, like if you want a new album out from a band, if you want a new video game out, buy their current albums and current video games from the publishers and you'll incentivize them to take and put out new stuff. And that's also something that happens in the software. It needs to happen in the software industry. People think that their software is too free, like too much free, but people write it like they got to get paid for it. And we, and we have a lot of these opinions as, um, 
as software developers. There are lots of services that I use for free all the time and I love them and I would never pay for them. A good example is Google Analytics. Like I love Google Analytics, but I would never pay for Google Analytics. Well, in that sense, you're technically paying for it, but it's not in a way that you're actually transacting yes, dollars I, for. Yes, exactly. I would never exchange dollars for the Google Analytics right. service. I think the big thing that people need to understand, um, myself keep reminded for it, is nothing is ever free. Even in the open source world, um, even if, yeah, if it says it's free to use, it's free to use that particular feature, that particular software on it. But to get full expanded features, you may need to put a support contract or a maintenance thing or everything like that. It's like, if you expect everything to be free, it's not. Like, yes. And that's like more like the installing certain softwares on certain things. But I, my, I know you're a huge advocate for doing open source software. I mean, it's uh, using it and contributing to it. So the going back to uh, giving out things for free, do you think giving out your product for free for a little while is a good way to do it? It's like back to the point of like when we were talking about time. Yeah. So if you're a consultant, your time is what you're giving out and it's not free. It's, it's discounted. It's 100%. I think that it's a marketing strategy. It's a good thing, but you need to convey the value of what you're giving. Otherwise, like, and that could be a product or a brand as well. Like if you're giving away 30 days of subscription, you need to provide reasons of why at the end of the day, after the 30, 30th day on the 31st day, why I'm going to be charging your subscription fee. Hmm. Because have you seen any good examples of companies that really bring home why they need their, they need your money? Yeah, I think um, some of the companies that take and work, um, I think Basecamp is probably one of the better ones that I've seen uh, in terms of using out that Basecamp. The former 37 Signals stuff, their software stack is they provide value as servicing a project management tool for users to take and do that. You can get a free trial, and once you start to get into it, it's built into your ecosystem. It's built into your workflow. I think... Companies that hook into workflow um, have a better chance of having standing power for it. But whenever I'm taking, like if we can take and look at like services, like software services, if I'm looking at something like AWS free tier, um, Mongo free tier, like Mongo lab free tier, like Azure credits, anything like that. Yes, I know they're free, but I know what that means. If I take and build a ton of services on top of it, I have to pay for it. So I think it's um, still like you can go into it knowing that it's free, but to take and build out a fully scalable application on any of those things, you're going to pay for it. I think it's a great way to get somebody into the ecosystem to start out. If it's like, it's like a test drive for a car, right? You get a free run around the block or two, but at the end of it, after that, you have to buy it. And I think that's what a lot of software services do. I think Amazon AWS is free tier for a year is great because it allows people to develop things out, learn things on a small scale. It gets you into the ecosystem once you're there and you're certified and you know how to use it. You can then move on to take and do bigger, better things there. It's a long play. Like whenever you're trying to do that, it's a long play. I think sometimes in the consumer side of things, it's very tough because the attention span, what is your consumer's attention span for what you're putting out? Mm. Yeah, I mean, AWS is its own beast. Once those companies get massive, they're not even charging for uh, they're not even charging for straight subscription anymore. They're almost charging you per usage. Right. Like the YouTube API, they charge you for like units mm -hmm. of that you consume. So yeah, things change a lot. The one, oh, one thing that I wanted to pick your brain about is when you first see problems, yeah, to solve. How did you find those problems? Like what, what was the, was it just sort of like random going through life, finding it? Were you talking to people? Did you experience it yourself? Yeah, I think problems for me to solve happens because of just like the nature of what I've done. Like, so I went to business school and so a lot of it, uh, I went through a marketing program. So a lot of it came from market analysis and market research and understanding, um, and looking at it from a business standpoint and then trying to take and figure out, are there ways of optimization for processes? Not necessarily using software, but like, is there a better way that we can take and get, you know, this from here to there and 
because like supply chain management as well. So when I took and started to take and develop like early on in my software career, uh, that like that idea, like, okay, it's like, I can see how this piece of software could be used to augment this business practice. That was the big thing to identify it. So, but the key isn't always trying to figure out or put the what in it's understanding the why and the how things are done to deliver a what to achieve the goal. Does that make sense? Is that kind of clear? Yeah. Hmm. I think, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, because it, it takes a certain amount of awareness to question problems around you. Right. I mean, there's things that you see, like I see every day, like I'm trying to get from my apartment to your apartment and the bus takes forever. Yep. And there are problems that I simply accept and I don't question it. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, a big part of it is building the awareness to say, like, these problems can be solved. Yeah, I think any problem can be solved. But the question is, is are you the person to be solving it? That's true. Yeah. Like, are there people in better situations that not necessarily in better situations, but have the situations or resources that, you know, like for the bus thing, like a a way to solve that would be talking to somebody at the CTA potentially to yeah. help alleviate that situation. Will it take and do? Maybe not. Maybe you're the only one solving that problem, but you're providing to them part of their market validation. You know, you're giving them a data point where it says, okay, this person is, everything's about the, the at, like from a branding perspective, how somebody takes and interacts with your entity, right? It could be good. It could be bad. There's going to be in the connected world that we have right now, it's a, we could put reviews out on any platform, good or bad. You control, you, the company need to control that messaging, right? And I know this is again, not a minimum vile product, yeah. we're kind of drifting, but that message can kill your brand instantly. If not just one person says it, but if 10 people say it. So if you go to a restaurant and one person says it's not clean, and then another person says it's not clean, and the third person says it's not clean, you're going to have problems with that because of this social world where it's like, wow, three people say it's not clean in this past like three weeks. That's probably not good. But if you have people say that three people in the past three weeks said that this is the best food I've ever had, it's the most immaculate service, I love it, I come back here, it can put you on an exponential growth pattern that is huge. So I think knowing that there are messages out People always vote with their dollars. Um, people are always going to complain, but understanding like how to release a product into that or taking it even just change a process is a huge, huge thing. When, when you find the problem you want to solve, do you usually start going at it alone or do you find other people first? I usually try to validate first by myself to see if it's a, if it's a me thing. Okay. If it's a, um, usually uh, I take a look at it from a standpoint of like, is this market set up in a way, is this a market trend or is this in a market anomaly? Like, is this something that I saw as a one-off thing? Like, oh, it's not the norm or is this a habitual problem in the space? Once I take and identify if it's a habitual problem in the space, then I start to bring in other people. Hey, can you identify this? It's like a software testing a bug. It's like, first off, if I find a bug in software, I'm going to try to reproduce it consistently on my device before bringing in somebody else. Because when you start to bring in other people there's time you have to respect people's time and that can be that can be tough times so, like if it's like oh no it's not here or if you keep bringing things back to people it's like man just leave me alone don't do this like it might not be worth it so i think alone just identifying like to understand the macro part of it like to just get an understanding of what 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 the stadium looks like that you're playing the game in and then you start to figure out, okay, where are the players? Where are the goalposts? Where is this? Where are the concession stands? How do the people get in? Once you finally understand that, okay, I said goalpost. I didn't necessarily mean I'm playing football. The problem is that they're playing rugby or Canadian football. Then you can take and say, okay, bring in other people who could be coaches. It's like, how do we take and attack a problem that we can solve there? It's a very loose analogy, but... One thing, I've, uh, one thing that you touched on that I've been struggling a lot with is... Definitely want to respect people's time. And another thing that I'm, I, it's like I'm still slowly learning is being able to match people's dedication. 
because people can totally be down, say I'm willing to invest time and I'm willing to put my energy and emotion forth, but a lot of it is also being equally dedicated or having a role that keeps, that is reflective of the dedication that people want to put forth. Yeah, expand on that. Give me a little bit more of an example. Yeah, for example, I'm working on a project with a couple friends and a big part of it is we're all super busy and it's nice that we can all be partially dedicated to it because it's something that we enjoy and we enjoy building together. But I always try to keep an eye out for someone who really wants to dedicate a lot of time to it because that person should be empowered to dedicate time right. to it. And I don't want that person to look at everyone else and say, I'm, I'm the only one really hauling. Yeah. Managing expectations and aligning those in the early stance is a huge, huge thing. Otherwise it's, it's already fraught for, it's already fraught for danger and people, you know, regardless of what they bring to the table in the software side of things or this or that, and the other thing, think that they have different values of ownership. And I think it kind of goes back to that book you were talking about. It's yeah. like, um, figure out if there's a product there to take and actually build um, first figure out if there's a market figure out if there's a need like and sometimes that's tough to do like when you have teams that are big that's why I try to like in early ideas start off alone like yeah and figure out okay get an MVP out you know I'm starting alone I'm getting this MVP out and then after that, it's like, okay, maybe I need to bring in somebody who knows more marketing or stuff. Like just to go off of what we were talking about before with your lesson on branding, it's like, okay, now I know I need to bring in somebody in for branding because I'm doing a financial product or something along that nature. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see. Um, it always comes back to what people feel fairly trusted. And I think we have to build everything in a win-win situation. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so like what are some traps or missteps that – you've seen people focusing on too much in like the early stages of product development. I would say the most commonly missed thing I see is people will see a problem. They will attempt to solve it. And they, while attempting to solve it, they will accept the fact that there will be huge obstacles when a lot of the times the obstacles you encounter on the way to solving your problem are the problem you should be solving. Really? So uh base camp or 37 signals or whatever they're calling themselves these days, um, their base camp. One thing they're really, really hammer on is you sell your byproducts. Right. And I feel a lot of things that I constantly see people missing on is like we were talking earlier about um, about a technology that would be useful in some startups. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people will see that and they'll say, well, this problem exists. I better just use the most convenient solution out there, even though it sucks. Right. Like your company should be about that problem. I mean, or at least if that company is not, not about that problem, if you build a solution to that problem, sell that problem. Yeah, license sell that it solution. to somebody. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a key to it. I think it goes back to one of the missteps that I see is people get so eager, they get burned out too fast and don't do enough research um, about their market prior to going into it. And they don't understand the actual ramifications of what they're trying to build. So like from a sales cycle standpoint, from a... Like if you're trying to build a product that's in certain industries, you might not be able to sell your product for three years. Can you sustain that? Can you sustain selling for a long period of time without making any revenue? And what that looks like is very different than if you're trying to sell, you know, a game or something different, like knowing what doing the research. I think a lot of times that people skip that, like doing the research, listening to their customers and getting something out the door. As as developers, I feel we're both blessed and cursed to have the the privilege of intimately knowing the costs of not doing your research before you start building, right. but you also have the curse of you now know, like you always, if you don't do enough research, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've seen the bills before, we've paid them. Yeah. What recommendation do you rec- what recommendation do you have for people that are trying to articulate value of so you have the notion of potentially building a website out for somebody. And there's a difference between a website, a web application, an API. There's but people think it's on the internet, it's a website. Um some people will think that that website costs five hundred dollars, and they can have all the bells and whistles of everything, and it could be Google, but not understand what Google costs to just do that homepage. So, what recommendations do you have for people that are trying to convey value from a technical standpoint to somebody who may be a non-technical in that early stage of like 
here's the research that I'm coming back with. It's going to cost you $210,000 to build this platform out. To a lot of people, that's buying a Bentley. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big believer in in scratching your own itch and when you are one of the customers then it's easier to convey that right. to convey that value but one thing that you've mentioned a couple times is going out to people and saying you know this will cost like you said sixty five thousand dollars would you pay this and if they say yes how how have you gone about collecting even that initial validation and then coming back to them with products and have you gotten to the point at which you've been able to actually get someone to say yes and come back to them with a product um, I have in the past, usually it's been smaller than that, but I think one of the ways that you can do it from a standpoint, like legally is you can get a purchase order built out, like saying, Hey, I'm going to build this, um, or a, some sort of in writing commitment for it. Yeah. Somebody's not going to pay for it, but it's a validation for it. You can take and use that vehicle to take and build out different things from there. Have you actually gotten them signed before? I've gotten some signed on smaller things. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. But it's like. Or it's like, we've seen it at Startup Weekend where people have done it, um, where they'll go out and they'll get people to pay five bucks for an app that's not even built. And they'll come back and it's like, yeah, here's 75 bucks I raised. Like, there's five people here that said, like, there's this number of people here that have said, I will pay for this. And they've wanted to. And they show $75 in cash. Yeah, It's like, that's validation. It doesn't have to be the huge contract for it. But it's like, okay, you have a payable thing. It's like, and understanding that it's a math thing and figuring out what the threshold is because everything comes down to sales funnel, right? At you lose 10% every time you go from a prospect down to a client or a prospect to a lead, or is it, no, you lead to a prospect, to a client, to so on and so on and so on, to paying customers. You start to have that trickle down effect. Um, if you're in an industry where you get $75, let's just say it's roughly that. Okay, maybe that was what 75 i'm doing my math right it's saturday i'm not doing math well it's right all now. right um let's say you had 20 paying customers right um that are paying you a dollar and you asked 100 people would you be willing to do that that's 20 percent, right if you're getting 20 percent on your idea and the market validation converts customers at 60 percent, that's a data point that you need to know you need to know that your what your idea should be converting 40% more customers. So your idea may not be good for that marketplace. However, if your marketplace converts three customers you can, and you've converted 20 and you barely have the idea, you know that there's 17% more served by your product. So you understand like, I mean, we could talk about things like price elasticity and different things, but that's market validation right there. It's not only just like, will somebody be willing to pay for it? How do you compare to your direct customers or indirect customers? One of the big things that I always talk about with, um, with dollars in terms of validating a user's willingness to it, I look at the entertainment space. When you look at it uh, in an entertainment space, if you're going to the movies and you're spending $30, right? To go to, get popcorn and all that stuff, is it... Are, you, are your dollars there versus entertainment dollars and movie dollars? Or are they, would a video game compare to a movie in terms of competition? Does a video, you're still spending money. It's out of the entertainment sector. So you have to look at the indirect competition too, that things that, that dollars could be spent on elsewhere, right? Yeah. So that $30 could be bought on a video game and somebody could be there because the end goal from a customer standpoint is I'm trying to get entertainment. I have $30 I'm willing to allocate towards entertainment. That could be going to the zoo. That could be going to a movie. That could be buying a video game. That could be reading a book, buying a book to read. So, and then you try to look at it from, okay, what number of doll like hours of entertainment satisfaction are you getting? And then you can see like how indirect competition matters when you're trying to launch a product. Yeah, and I feel that also uh, goes into pricing what you want to sell. Yeah, I mean uh, the one thing that is scary for uh, especially people. I mean, I've never created something truly novel, but I imagine something very scary for people creating things that are truly novel is that you really have no 
baseline or reference point for how you're going to price anything. Yeah, I've seen it on Hacker News a lot. Like, have you seen some of the articles where it's like, oh, show Hacker News and they got a product out and the guys are like, yeah, I just don't know how to price it. And like, I'm charging five bucks a month for this thing. And it's like, there's always like comments like, dude, you need to be charging 500 for this for a month. It's like, whoa, I didn't even know that market is there. I think people can get trapped in that too. Yep. And that's, again, it goes back to like one of the first things that we talked about with anytime you're building an MVP or anything like that is understand the market, like understand who your competitors are, like, and know that it's not what you're building now. If your competitor has a lead space on you and that like lead time on you, they can see what you're doing and then build it. Yeah. It's not about the person who's first to market. It's about the last man standing. Right. Yeah. So there are barriers to entry in terms of some of these different industries, like you go into, you know, law enforcement analytics or something like that. You have to get clearance. If you go into government stuff, you have to get clearance. So there's some industries that are just hard to compete. But if you're taking and working on like, if you're trying to build an app that does solitaire stuff, but like it's super solitaire, there's low barriers to entry. So you got to know that the market could be saturated all these things play into it. Um, I'm just looking at my questions here yeah. and it's like, uh, I think we talked a little bit about this, but let's say we had the minimum viable pro product out in the marketplace and the response is not what we thought. Uh, what recommendations do you have people, um, for people that are in this situation? Like we talked about it a little bit with the pivot stuff, but so do you always cut and move on? Do you pivot? Do you fail fast? Like, do you shut it down? I think the big thing for me is never give up. Like yes. just because your idea isn't good, that doesn't mean you're not good and you can't build something else. Move on to the next one is a lot of the advice I can give sometimes. I'm a big believer in Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. Like just put in the time. Yeah. But I had a really, I, a long time ago, I was trying to learn guitar and a friend of mine was really good at guitar. And I asked him, what's the best way I should learn? Like if I want to be good at guitar and his advice, I, I asked him was, should be like practicing scales, like trying to play a song. And he said, do whatever keeps you at the guitar. Right. Like that's all that matters. Yep. And a lot of building products is exactly that. I mean, I didn't learn how to play the guitar, but I applied it to building stuff and it's just spending the time building things. Yeah. I think a lot of times is you can't give up on it. It's like people ask me a lot like, and you probably have gotten this when you've talked to people about like, Oh, how did you learn how to code You're a self taught code? Like you've learned how to code on yeah. your own. Like you did accounting. Like, I did marketing. How did you guys learn how to code? It's like, well, I just sat down and I started doing it. It's like, well, how did you do that? It's like, well, I literally sat down and I started Googling. Yes, those are the exact instructions. Yeah, and it's like people think you have to go through this uh, notion of going through a computer science program or going or boot through camps. a boot camp and spending that money. Like I started back in 2009 and it was just – the amount of resources that were there in 2009 compared to now or night and day. Now you have great services on there. Like you have code school, you have all these different things you can start to learn from that can direct you in that. But the key is you're not going to be that senior person day one. It's practice. And it's not like when you're developing software, the big thing is, is <laughs> the only reason you get more seniors is because you can identify what's broken faster and know how to fix it. Yes. It's because you've seen that error. And it's like, I think one of the big things also is you don't know what you don't know. And finding a mentor is a huge thing. So like, even when you're trying to build out a product or understanding brand, it's like, okay, have a mentor that's been there and done this who can teach you. I have mentors in several different uh, categories and verticals that have always been extremely helpful. So yeah, the also big piece of advice for people getting started is, and I, and I know we're kind of sidetracking, but to kind of bring it back is to, uh, I tell people, have an idea of something you want to build. Right. Like when I was, the way I learned web development is I was an accountant and I saw accounting software that I thought was missing and I just built that. Right. Yeah. If you're, you know, a, if you work in the beer industry, you should find something that you think is missing and build that. Yeah. For me, I started my career as in the music industry and I wanted to build software to help a broken industry, uh, help artists get paid. And so I built that. Yep. I built that different thing. And I was a hockey fan and I built an analytics platform there. Did they take in go to be commercially viable? Not necessarily by any means. Um, but what they did do is they help you 
coming back to that guitar every single day. It puts you in a mindset that you would, you'd want to take in, you know, like we talked about, if you've been working on something for 200 hours, it'll get you back to that 201st yep. hour. So you yep. got to find something that you're going to want to do and know that most often than not, most products aren't going to turn into anything. It's going to be something that's going to live in your GitHub repository and some servers that you have that you're going to kill, but you're going to learn best practices through doing it and help yourself. So when you do have that idea and the market is right, you're going to be able to strike while the iron's hot. You're just preparing yourself. It's, it's, it's like Michael Jordan going to the gym and shooting hundreds upon hundreds of basketballs. Oh, yeah. I've, I've really fallen in love with, uh, I think like I've dubbed it like entrepreneurial rap. Okay. Where it's these rappers saying they're in love with the game and they just spend hours in the booth. And uh, a lot of them will compare themselves to the greatest rappers of all time. But the one thing that Kanye doesn't show you is that he's written a lot of songs that he's deleted mm -hmm. off his laptop and he spent a lot of time making beats and rapping. Yeah, I mean... Like the, the 20 bajillion hours he spent are the hours you don't see. You just see the latest album he dropped that's selling like crazy. Right, and I think it's like, it's the grind. It's understanding that that you're never going to take and learn at all. And you need to continue to learn new things and practice and do things because at the end of the day, you can have the best people around you trying to help you out, but you got to do it on your own. you got to step up. Um, and be that contributor to whatever project you're working on and stuff. I think understanding your voice and contributing to a code project or this is a huge thing from a software standpoint and understanding the value that you bring. Like when you're trying to work with the team is a huge, huge thing, like especially early on. And you got to take pride out of it sometimes. It's, oh, yeah. It's tough to do sometimes, but... Um, How do you balance staying true to the grind and knowing when a product has no current market potential. Because to me, those are, there's a very gray line between the people who sink their lives into something that will never have a market and the people who understand that they're, for this moment in time is just them putting in hours. Yeah, I think for me, a lot of it has been, like my notion is I've, I'm a pretty much a pessimistic optimist. Um, and I take things in a very pragmatic approach. It's input, output. What you put there, there should be an input. What the input is should yield some sort of output given the variables that I've constrained. It's a very developer focused thing, but it's it's a fair, fairly linear. So if I put in X number of hours and I don't see that output that I'm expecting from it, adjust the formula. Something has to adjust in that formula. It's like, I think it all goes back to like when we first learned like the scientific process in third grade. It's like, you get a hypothesis, you test it, you have a variable set, you take and you have a control, you have an independent variable, and then you take and see what happens. And once you take and get those results and findings, you assess those and then figure out how to take and move to the next one. And I think that can happen, you know, daily, multiple times a day when you're working on it. Like even when you're building out a site. Okay, for this hour, I'm going to try to get this navigation built. My hypothesis is if I do these steps with these variables, I'm going to do that. So I think it's a lot of it is um, trying to divorce the personal feelings from it, from the project, and um, make it for more of like a um, objective versus a subjective decision and conscious effort um, to know when to quit. Like for the sports thing, uh, I knew that I was a hold pattern because the day I came back from Las Vegas, um, CBS had released a product that was almost identical to what I'd been building. And so I could have competed with CBS. I could have started, it would have been like if the race was 3000 steps, CBS was on like 2,994 and I was on 72. I had a, I had a skin in the game. I had invested lots of time, almost a year's worth of work into it. But did I want to take and compete with a multinational media organization that had access to all the data? And the question is, what would that cost? And would there be benefit out of it for the time? So I think that's a, like to answer your question, it's like you have to take and be pretty objective in it. But you have to have passion in it as well. Passion in the idea, but objective in the, in the approach and going forward with it. Like what are your thoughts on that? How do you take and uh, address that? Uh so my friend John, one of the best designers, front end guys I know, had turned me on to this beautiful concept where you 
start you start ignoring output and you start focusing solely on input. Okay. And I thought about it, and I guess to me it makes a lot of sense because you have these you have so you have these gymnasts and they spend their entire lives training for the Olympics. Right. And they go to the Olympics, and their job is to stand on that balance beam and just do some flips. Flips they've practiced millions and millions of times. Right. And a lot of them fall off. A lot of them don't do the flips right, even though they've practiced the, them millions and millions of times. And when you focus on that output, it can be kind of jarring because consistent output is almost a myth. Mm -hmm. You see people like Michael Jordan and Michael Jordan, someone who has dedicated their life to it still does not have consistent output. Right. And, but once you start focusing on input, once you start focusing on what you said, spending a couple hours every day working toward this, that is to me what takes you over the finish line. Right. Yeah. I think the consistent output, it's like you're never going to have, if you see somebody that says they're killing it every day with a smile on their face in the startup world, they're, they're very, they're probably extremely depressed. Yes. Because they're, or they're lying. They, well, that's why they're depressed because they're lying to others and they're lying to themselves. Um, because you can't have the consistent output. It's difficult. Like, especially when you're putting your own money up and your livelihood and you never know if someone's going to be there. Like you can release a product and you can think it's the best thing in the world. You put it on the internet and if no one sees it, if two people see it and you think you, it's the greatest thing, that could be deflating. So I think, yeah, looking at the output is tough sometimes. It's like, really tough. Like looking at like Michael Jordan, like talking about some of that, it's like you look at the output. His output was consistently better than others in the league, not because it was great, but it was because of all the input that he put into it and all that practice. You know, that's why LeBron James is one of the best too. It's like, these guys are gym rats. They're in the gym all the time practicing. And you can tell, totally tell, like with the best musicians, everybody that's at the top of their craft has hit that 10,000 hour. And the 10,000 hours is, it's just arbitrary. It could, yeah. be, it could be, if you're extremely gifted, it could be 5,000 hours. If you're, but the main thesis that Gladwell's trying to make with that is it's practice. It's practice. It's practice. You're not going to take and be unless you're amazingly gifted straight off the bat, you're not going to be able to dunk yeah. because you don't know the form on how to do that. But if you have consistent output or input trying to figure out how to dunk, eventually you're going to have to learn. You're going to have to dunk by just numbers of trial and error. You're going to get stronger. You're going to be able to know the form. You're going to be able to do different things to do it. So Yeah, and there are people who are very gifted and they can almost dunk right off the bat and good for them. That's great. But for most of everyone else, it's just, a whole lot of practice and a whole lot of time put forth. Yeah. So kind of kind of trying to recap a little bit and then one final question. It's like we've talked about different ways that can happen, like when you're starting to release a product, like in getting that minimum viable product up and trying to like collate what the resources are it's going to take to take and build that. And if things are bad, um, like how to take and change and go to the next thing and what things are there. What happens if it's good? What happens if it's, you've got your minimum viable product out. It's the minimum. Like it's your first like thing and people are loving it. And you're starting, you know that you have 60% more of project completion to get all the features that you thought of out the door. If people are loving the product the way it is and paying and, and responding to it, do those features that you have that are lying in the wind make it any better? Or can they make it worse? And also, you need to build them. Hmm. If So I've never had a successful product that I launch. Actually, my goal for this year is to launch something that generates a dollar, just to start out. And it's a good goal. Yeah. And uh, if I had something that people liked that they were willing to pay for, I would either start talking to people mm -hmm. that your customers, I mean, if they're paying for you, if they're paying $50 a month, I'm sure they're going to be plenty happy to respond to an email. Right. But a lot of it is if you treat it like a job, put in only the hours necessary. If you're building it because you really love it, then just you're getting paid to build something you love. Right. Well, I think let's take it to even like more like product standpoint. Yeah. And, excuse me. Uh, the new Mac. The new MacBook. We both have the older MacBook Pros. It's probably what you see most software engineers have. Like it's a solid machine. It's 
It's built with all the things that we need. It has none of the frills. It has all the ports that we need to take and work professionally. The new Mac has got that touch bar and all these things. I remember Microsoft, or not Microsoft, Apple came out with a survey asking people what to do. In my goal, and this is, it's a fully fledged product, but my, Apple had a product. They had a set of features that they thought they were going to take and build that are going to make benefit onto it. They release these features to their core product and now their brand is suffering because of that, because they didn't listen to that. Do you see that could happen from a software standpoint? Like if you had, like, let's put a hypothetical. If your app that you were talking about earlier, the check-in app, had 10,000 user signups in the first day and it was growing up 10% every day and you were growing it there, but you were only 30% of the way in. If you took and added some new features that you thought were like the key features, do you think that potentially customers or your user base could fall off because you've changed what their product is? Like Facebook first started off as you had to have a .edu address and it was college kids. And then they went more global. Now, once you went more global and let everybody in, some of those college kids fell off like that demographic of what it was because it changed the product. Yeah. Do you see that happen in certain things? I feel that a lot of people do struggle with the question of what do I build next? Should I build this? And just as purely personal opinion, right. I feel there is way too much inaction in the world and you should just take action. If okay. you're sitting there saying, do I do a ton of research before I build this? Do I build this right now? Just do something. Right. Like whether that's doing research yes. is something, building yes. this is something, building a new company is something. Yes, do something. That's right. that's all I care about. Solve there problems. are way too many people just sitting there wondering what to do. Do something. Yeah, you just solve problems. Like that's the end of the day is the goal is trying to figure out how to solve problems and kind of goes back to your question you were asking me. Solving problems, identifying what the problem is, figuring out the process that is involved first. See if it's an anomaly. If it is an anomaly, figure out, okay, how can the process be bettered? If it can be bettered, can software do it? And that's my approach towards everything, like in terms of that particular no, thing. I completely agree. That's awesome. Um, perfect. Well, so Adam, Thank you again for being on the podcast today. I think it was an absolute treat and I hope you enjoyed your time as well. Um, as I like to do on the podcast, I like to open up the floor for you to share anything to the audience, uh, anything off the top of your mind. Uh, the, yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah, the biggest thing is um, a lot of people want to get started in the space and they really want to get their hands dirty with solving a problem. And so much of it is simply Putting like I mean, my personal version of it is going to a coffee shop, putting in headphones and taking out a MacBook. Mm -hmm. Some other people's version of it might be going out and talking to potential customers. The biggest thing is just find something that is a call to action. At the end of the day, no problem will ever be fixed unless you are in the trenches getting your hands dirty, building a solution. That's awesome. Yeah, I can't agree. I, I totally agree with that 100%. Is you got to take action and know that it's okay to take in do something for a day and then shelve it. Like oh yeah. Some of the best, like I hear musicians sometimes talk about like writing three or four songs a day for a year. And it's not that they're trying to do it because everyone's going to be a hit, but you have to get that creative process going. So yeah, yeah I totally agree. Um, again, thank you for joining us today for episode four of the opinionated stance podcast. Um, as I like to do with all of my guests, I like to give a little token of my appreciation. So hold on one second. Adam, here you go. Uh, please <laughs> uh, read to everybody what it is. Uh, uh, this is the uh, Fable 3 on the Xbox 360. Great game, by the way. Yes. Uh, and it says, Adam, thank you for being on the show. Uh, may you have a great journey on the path of life. Signed, Patrick. Awesome. Another autographed copy going out of the personal <laughs> collection. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for being on the show. Uh, if you have any questions or if you're here listening and have not done so, visit opinionatedstancepodcast.com or let me try that again, opinionatedstance.com. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play. Also, I'm going to have Adam reiterate this also. Also subscribe to it on YouTube. Um, if you have any comments, questions, show ideas, reach out. We'd love to hear the feedback from the listeners. Thank you again for listening to our shows and episodes until next time. I'm Patrick 
I'm Adam. Awesome. Cheers. We are out. This is a wrap.